Hey, how are you? Thanks for coming by. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 826, with my guest today, Mr. Rokas Leonovichus. I appreciate you being here. If you're new to martial arts radio, what do we do? Well, we connect, educate, and entertain. We want everyone in the world to train, and that's why we do so many different things. Go check out whistlekick.com. Use the code PODCAST15. Buy something in the store. Show us some love. Maybe join our Patreon. You can get all kinds of exclusive and behind the scenes cool stuff starts at two, a measly $2 a month. And we've got tiers that go up from there. There's a bunch of cool stuff. And I'm going to let you hunt around and find all the cool stuff, find the stuff that you want to interact with. Now, there's something else going on today that is really important. And that is that this episode is sponsored. And when we have a sponsored episode, the major thing I ask of you, show the sponsor some love. In this case, it's Jason Brick with Safest Family on the Block. Great friend great supporter of everything we've done. He is one of us for sure. And I want you to go check out Save His Family on the Block, his podcast, which brings together martial arts, journalism, and parenting, family safety, all kinds of cool things, not just in terms of martial arts and self-defense, but also in terms of driving safety, mental health. If you could think of a topic that relates to a family, and keeping a family safe and healthy in the modern world. Jason's probably covered it. And if he hasn't, I bet if you reach out to him, he'll find an expert that he can bring on the show to make sure that he gets some great information on that subject because he's that kind of guy. He's a very, very smart man, knows a ton of great stuff. And that's why he put together such a cool book that extends the information from the podcast. And if you want, you can save 25% on that book using the very generous code WHISTLEKICK23 and you can connect with the safest family on the block and Jason and order that book by following him on Instagram or on Facebook, safest family on the block, or checking out the links in the show notes. And I hope that you do. I'm asking you to, right? This is this is important. We we need to support our sponsors, right? They they help us out. And so there we are. All right. Now today's episode with Rokas. Mr. Rokas Leonovichus, and I'm saying the name multiple times because I, I want to get it right. I want to get it right. I want to make sure that I show him the effort. It's an awesome, awesome conversation. We talked about, we've heard different flavors of this story before, where you kind of start doing one thing, and then it kind of changes a bit. And I, you know what? I'm going to ruin it. I don't want to ruin it. I want this to unfold for you as it goes. So check it out. Enjoy. And I'll see you in the outro. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, also worked with Shadows just an hour ago filming a video, like, you know, lighting and everything. I hate yeah. that stuff. <laughs> it's the worst. Yeah, it's, you know, my, my least favorite part about video is that it takes so long to do it well. Yeah. Right? Like, like if I wanted great lighting in here, I've got good lighting, but if I wanted great lighting, that's yeah. hundreds of dollars and prep time every single time because, you know, the lights end up in this tiny, slightly different location and everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's the curse I, I set myself upon right now is I started to look at quality much more. And that's, you know, the, I think it's the parrot's law. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it right in English, but the 2080 rule. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, 20% creates 80% result. And I am, I in the past, that was all about like, yeah, do 20% of work, have 80% result, good. And recently, I'm like, I want the 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 last 20% of result, and it takes yeah, yeah. Just so much more effort. But that's why most I people guess, don't do it. Yeah, I guess it's worth it. I hope it is. <laughs> I, I think the key is knowing when to stay at the 20% effort and when to do more. Yeah. It's a good one. I like that. You know, for yeah. a long time, we were audio only and it was so easy. Guests would come on and, you know, I could be wearing anything Yeah. <laughs> and the lighting didn't matter and it didn't matter if I was focused on them. You know, I, when I talk to people, yeah. you know, especially if I'm thinking I tend to, you know, I'm one of these, I tend to look around, but I can't do that when I do this show. I have to look at you Yeah. and that took a yeah. lot of work. <laughs> so I was resistant to it, but. Yeah, I guess. But uh, I think, you know, it's maybe the challenge is when somebody starts from the get go at like wanting to do the 100 percent thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I'm just kind of thinking out loud, but I think that's difficult because there's a lack of experience. The person still doesn't really know what they're looking for. And then it's just too much versus 
when if we're doing this for a while, and I think it sounds like that was your case as well, and, and that was definitely my case, I've been doing this, my thing for a while. And then eventually, I'm like, I guess I'm so con- comfortable with doing what I'm already mm. doing. And I know what works, what doesn't work in that realm, might as well expand and push myself further. And it kind of worked so far, but but I still, I'm still kind of laughing for myself thinking that probably sometimes, like you mentioned, you have to choose the right time when to do it and when not to do it. And I think sometimes I'm like, probably nobody will care. Like there's a specific moment in the, the ultimate self-defense championship thing I did. And I had two versions of like the opening scene and they were switched around. Like there's one detail which was switched around. And for me, I felt, I thought that's like, that's like so you important. You over it. You, yeah. yeah. And I sent it to like five different people and four of them were like, isn't this the same clip? I'm like, no, you're missing the whole point. This. So and what, what did the fifth one say? Uh, the fifth one was like, okay, I get it. And I think like this one is better, but I don't really think there was a big difference. And I was like, yeah. Damn, I spent like two hours obsessing about it. So who knows? I, I, yeah, the, the way you talked about, you know, jumping in and going for 100% right off the bat, that's so many people's introduction to martial arts. Yeah. Right. Whether it's because the, the instructor wants them to know so much on their first day that they can't help but come back or because of yeah. their own personal commitment. I don't know if you were, if yeah. you're that kind of a person that when you jump into something, you're just like all in and it's all you do. It's all you think about. I'm 100% like that. I'm an extreme guy. I'm all or all or nothing in most yeah. cases. And uh, I think as for the student side of things, I think that's uh, a little bit bad because I think that's possible to abuse it. And I think my instructors to some degree abused it. I don't think they did it like consciously in order to abuse it. But I think it's just that dynamic developed into where I'm like, I'm giving myself all, I'm not questioning. And then I end up not always doing things which are the best for me. Uh, but also then as an instructor and to, on the flip side of things, when I was an instructor, and especially when I realized that I actually took over that without realizing from my instructor, mm. it's kind of abusing the power, not like dramatically, but there were moments I realized that there's that same dynamic between me and my students, how I was with my mm. instructor and it wasn't always good. I started questioning that. And then also in regards to welcoming new people, uh, I started looking and realizing, okay, maybe I shouldn't just like, as you said, like I shouldn't just throw everything at them and and be like, oh, let's I'll teach you in one go everything I know. But versus instead, I'm like, okay, let's see your pace, let's see how much you want, what what you're interested in. And I think that was a much healthier uh, approach. And there's some people who are like, give me everything, and then you still you need to stop them and be like, well, let's see, maybe you don't need everything yet. Right. But yeah, it's it's a tough dynamic. I, I bet if we were to to look at the schools that have classes, you know, three, four, five, six, seven days a week, you know, cause you get people who start and like, this is going to be my whole life. It's going to be my identity. I'm going to go every yeah. single day. They tend to burn out so fast. Yeah, 100%. You know, there are some people who make it through that cause that's just how they're built. But I think most people, when they start that way, they fall off cause it's not sustainable. And if they can't do the six days a week they committed to, they might as well do zero days a week. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think, think it would yeah, serve a lot of school owners to mm. limit the amount that new students can attend. I think that's smart. Uh, I think s- smart instructors probably do that. They're, they don't like encourage that mm. uh, obsessive behavior. I think it's it's kind of a fine line, I guess, to, to give way for that, but not to give too much. Uh, and personally, like I, I was one of those few people, like you mentioned, especially in the past, where I could just go all out and I was fine, but also I was like under my twenties and then in my yeah. early twenties. So, so I guess that was the right time to do that. Plus my character is like that. But later on in my, like when I started switching to combat sports, I was like 29, I think. And that was not the same as 21 or, or 19. And I would burn out much faster. And part of me is almost upset that my instructors didn't hold me back because they technically knew what a burnout is hmm. they, it felt like to me like okay i'm new here i didn't know about it i had to read read about it and learn like why am i not sleeping so well anymore why am i <laughs> why am i regressing and not progressing yeah. and and we kind of talked about it but then it's funny i guess there's also that ambitious side of instructors where they want the student to achieve the maximum hmm. and uh, when i would like be burnt out or like half sick like they would still be like, yeah, but you can still come in and, and, and train and maybe it's going to be fine. And I'm looking at it back now, right now. I'm like, no, you were supposed yeah. to tell me just stay in your bed and don't come unless like you really feel good. 
so yeah it's i think you're right instructors should uh probably hold those people back yeah so you said when you got into combat sports which, which suggests you were different doing a different style of training so you know let's let's go back what's your sure. what's your introduction to training look like yeah so uh well first it was just geeking out about traditional martial arts samurai and the east i guess that's a common story very common uh, yeah uh, then I was invited to try out Aikido and fell in love from the first day with it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I became obsessed and uh, I guess lucky for me, I was a sickly kid. So I would kind of go for a few months hard and then skip like a month because of being sick, come back. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I would just, and whenever I could, I just kept doing eventually I, and after school, I decided to do it, uh, to aim for the professional kind of level. Mm-hmm. And went to be a living student uh, in an Aikido school for a few years. And then eventually I became an instructor. So, so that was like my Aikido journey. But also I did like other stuff like Ving Chun, a little bit of karate. But mainly it was Aikido. I was very much an Aikidoka. Hmm. Did you, I guess, fall into Aikido accidentally or were you looking for Aikido? I wasn't really looking for Aikido. But as I mentioned, I already was into samurai stuff. Uh, and the it was the swords, swords also the hakama, you know the, <laughs> yeah. the fancy pants. That's 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 one of the best things about it. Uh, that's <laughs> I, that's how I'm going to refer to hakama from now on is fancy pants. Fancy pants. I think, I that's, think that's the that's... best the best description I've heard. <laughs> it it kind of is. It's kind that's of like it, that. That's the thing. And uh, so just when I didn't know what aikido is before I went in there, just a friend of mine mm-hmm. was like, "Hey, let's go let's try it together," and I went in and. Part of that, yes, I saw the swords. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to learn swords and hand-to-hand fighting. And then I'm going to get a, the, hip, the fancy pants one time, like eventually one day. And But then I also started reading the Aikido books, like the Mori Hiroshiba, the founders, Art of Peace. It's somewhat known these days, like uh, The Walking Dead, even a TV show used mm-hmm. it in one of the episodes. And everyone's like, oh, what is Aikido now? So I read it before The Walking Dead. <laughs> so uh, I loved it. It was really like, I was like a peaceful guy by nature. And uh, the philosophy that I read about Aikido, I was like, this is like exactly what I'm looking for. And then I was already, it was already appealing from the way it looked and it worked, especially like the whole, it's not violent. We're not punching each other. We're redirecting. So I like that already. And then the more I read about it, the more I was like, this was made for me. And I guess it kind of was for a long time. Hmm. Okay. Mm. For a long time suggests that there might have been <laughs> a, a, a cutoff, a hard end yes. rather than a fade. So yes. is that something you'll talk about? Yes. Very observant. <laughs> uh, I I did cut it off quite abruptly. Mm. It was obviously it was a process. Uh, but after a number of years, it was actually quite a few years, but I started off with Aikido as uh, a philosophical martial art, but also I was investing into it as a self-defense practice uh, because I was growing up in a rough city. I was constantly seeing violence. I got to experience Where did you violence. Grow? It's a, a country called Lithuania. So mm-hmm. uh, not really known uh, unless somebody like has something to do with it but uh, lithuania is a post-soviet country so after Mm -hmm. the soviets left uh the country was kind of in a crazy situation where the law was barely existing Mm -hmm. Uh, it took a while until democracy and uh, law enforcement developed and during that period a lot of crime was happening and i was living in the hot spot of all of that like the city Uh which had the most crime like shootouts in the street i didn't ever i never saw one but apparently they would happen uh but i but there were old gangs like older gangs like adult people and mm-hmm. then the younger generation was copying them and i was not part of that i was the mm-hmm. part of the i was the opposite i was the peaceful kid so i was the target constantly me and my friends so yeah i was i saw a lot of that uh and then i wanted to protect myself i wanted to protect my my friends and i was promised that aikido will teach me that my first instructor was saying that it works uh it never did for me personally mm. uh, like i was attacked a number of times try to use aikido but fell back to just like punching and running away which works great <laughs> but it wasn't like you know you know it was it wasn't like fancy aikido moves which i learned uh then i thought that my first instructor is the issue uh i moved to a different country i went to like a high level instructor became a living student 
and then uh, uh, he was a little bit more cautious about the self defense stuff, but he still said, "Okay, this is this still works. This is this is mm. great," and uh, it still didn't really work. And then eventually, I pressure tested it. I was kind of clear that okay, this is not the best martial art for self defense, and I'm fine with it. But then I thought it still works to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it didn't work for me. And uh, eventually I pressure tested my Aikido. And it's kind of a long story, but making it short, uh, I pressure tested it and uh, realized, okay, it's it's much less effective than I thought. But my trouble was that my instructor wasn't on the same page. She was like, oh, no, it works. But kind of like, you're wrong. You shouldn't question Aikido. And that turned me off. Uh, and eventually I started feeling like I'm, I was very clear to my students, okay, I'm not teaching you self-defense, but still I felt, I felt like I'm not honest with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually I was so interested to learn what I wanted to learn initially. That was self-defense and fighting. And one uh, gentleman suggested for me to completely drop everything and just focus on that mm. and it's an extreme and you know radical decision yeah. but i was like that that's my type of lifestyle and i was like you know what let's do it so i quit aikido closed my dojo and uh my first step was i enrolled in a six months uh intensive mma training uh kind of camp so to speak yeah so that was that was yeah that was it Given that some of the appeal of Aikido for you was the, the philosophical aspect, the peacefulness, mm. what was it like emotionally to let that go? Um, it was a mixed bag of things. I think I was part lucky because I was gradually becoming aware that Aikido is not giving me what I was promised that mm. it will give in terms of like being able like. To speak to speak of like a specific example, my my second main instructor, the high level Aikidoka, he said that if you're a black belt, like a first degree black belt, you should be able to deal against an untrained fighter. If you're a third degree black belt, you should be able to deal with a trained attacker, mm-hmm. like you know, like a fighter. And uh, I was third degree black belt by the time I quit Aikido. And when I tried it with a fighter, like a friendly sparring, and he was like super gentle with me, it did not work whatsoever. So I was like, wait, that was not true what he said to me back then. But uh, so the lucky part, coming back to the main point, was that I gradually got exposed to, okay, it doesn't work so great. Maybe it's even worse than I thought. Maybe it's even worse. And I was like, okay, because Aikido is very much also philosophical martial art. And I was leaning onto that. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm all about philosophy. I love it. Uh, but I still kind of held a spot of belief that it works to some degree. Like if it's like an extreme life or death situation, maybe it's going to kick in. Mm. Uh, but it, it wasn't like my what my core belief wasn't like I'm amazing and I would kick everyone's ass. Like that, that, and if, if that's you know what a, a martial artist thinks and then they get destroyed by someone else, I know that's extremely hard. I, I met mm. these people. I spoke to them. I know that's like, that's shocking because it's like a single moment and your whole narrative gets destroyed. For me, I only got my portion of narrative destroyed, which was like, it it still works in extreme conditions. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, maybe it doesn't. But so that wasn't too hard on me. But the hard part was that uh, the organization that I was part of, part of, like my, I considered it my family, uh, lots of different. I was part of the instructor circle. Lots of instructors who are my friends, the members, mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't understand what I'm talking about. Questioning Aikido, they were like, "Uh, we're not sure." Like I was starting, I started to talk about problems like with over focusing on tradition and and arrogance that may come from some instructors from that, uh, and uh, the lack of pressure testing and questioning, mm-hmm. and they couldn't see where I'm coming from. And eventually, I was essentially suggested to either stop questioning Aikido or quit mm. so I quit uh they did not see that coming I think my instructor was my sensei was expecting me to stay to take the ultimatum on the other side but that was hard because uh I realized people who I spent so much time with did not see eye tight with me like they couldn't see where I'm coming from and uh, also when I quit the organization uh, no member contacted me like all of my friends were mm. like I was like oh these are my people they're like, nobody wrote to me anything. They're like, 
oh, sorry, dude. Or like, are you okay? Like nothing. And I was like, I felt betrayed. I felt lost and confused. Then I started questioning my sensei's philosophy as well. I was like, wait, if he's wrong about fighting, maybe there's a chance that he's wrong about the philosophy to some degree. And there's a lot of, there's, there's a portion of things which were great, but there's also a portion of things which were not. And mm. I was taking the whole thing at the same time. So initially I threw the baby with the bathwater. I was like, oh, it's all crap. I hate it. This is terrible. I have, no, I want nothing to do with this. So that was hard. That was painful because that was, I think that was the hard part because that was my identity, the philosophy, mm. the, the core belief systems of Aikido. And when I had to throw that away, I was like, okay, so who am I without that? Like suddenly wow. I'm like, I don't know. You know is that whatever. why you went into MMA? Because uh, I think a lot of people would look at, if we were to, you know, somehow chart out martial arts on some sort of yeah. spectrum, yeah. Aikido, you could make the argument, it's kind of at one end of that spectrum yeah. and, and MMA kind of being the opposite. Yeah, I think it's very true. I think because Aikido is all about peace and MMA is not all about violence. That's not fair to say, but still there's there's a lot of, violence to some degree we're punching each other in the face so uh, i think some people commented on that because i actually recorded all of that journey it's it's all public it's mm. all it's all on record on my channel that was that's my what my channel became about prior your, your, prior, your youtube channel yeah I'm talking about, yeah. yeah prior to that it was uh, all about aikido tutorials and just my mm. perspective and then because i was making the shift and i was a master of none i was like well might as well just you know make a <laughs> make it public why not sure so so some people were commenting and saying, oh, you're just taking one extreme and going to the other. But also in regards, and I, I think that's reflective of my character, which we discussed mm. a little bit already about, is I went like from, I'm going to be the, I, I, I never went like, I'm going to be aggressive or, or something like that. But, but I still went from identifying myself uh, with the martial art, which is super peaceful, to going to identify myself with more like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or MMA. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is still kind of low-key in terms of violence. But but I kind of uh, latched onto that for a while and mm -hmm. kind of started developing my identity there. But I think because of the experience, because I already uh, went through being too identified with something and then getting burnt from it, uh, I was aware of it in the process. And soon enough, I was like, okay, let me make, let me make sure I don't do the same mistake. And I look at the pros and cons of whatever I do from early stages instead of doing this for 10 years and then like hey wait so i definitely received a lot of i think very positive qualities from uh, combat sports uh like uh this is kind of sprouting into another subject but sure but quickly touch it like in aikido uh the peaceful nature you kind of become not only identified with it but it also becomes kind of your way of being uh, internally and externally like you know uh, it's kind of semi-joke but semi-true uh the having a ponytail <laughs> i had one you know like the whole steven seagal samurai thing and and then i was much skinnier i think i was and I, was, I was also doing yoga so that was mm -hmm. part of that too the yoga meditation so i i was skinny to a degree which was not healthy uh and so i didn't look healthy but i thought like that's the way to go and the way I carried myself, I didn't feel comfortable. I think that was the con of the whole thing. I didn't feel comfortable. Like when I started going to MMA gyms, I was really intimidated because everyone looked so scary and they have these tattoos and they're all making like alpha male jokes. And I'm like, okay, what did I say? I don't know how, you know, how to function in this environment. And then I don't think I became that, that type of guy, which again, it's not a bad or good thing, but I didn't become one, but I became comfortable with that. And now if I meet some MMA fighters, like a uh, quick funny story, I was filming an event, uh, like a Bellator event, like a major MMA promotion and in London. And I was sitting with my friend, like an old time friend in a cafe and the hotel, which was hosting all the fighters uh, was next by. And all the streets were packed with like these buff, scary dudes. And they're just walking around looking for a place to eat. And my friend, I see he's looking at them and he doesn't feel comfortable. He's intimidated by all, the, all of them just walking around. I'm like, like, hey, I used to be that dude. And I'm like, now I'm looking at them like, I know these are good dudes. Like, I know I could talk to them. I know I could spar with them. I mean, they would kill me, but I could spar. <laughs> so long story short, uh, I think it was a great transformation that I became comfortable with that different realm. Mm. It made me more balanced. And now I think I'm, I'm not like uh, latched onto any of them, or at least I try not to be, but I just take the best I can. Mm.
of course, there's a lot of conversation about MMA versus or in relation to traditional martial arts. What do you think was different for your experience stepping into that gym with your Aikido background versus the other folks who were coming in with no traditional martial arts background? Yeah. Um, I think, well, the shocking part initially is that it, the the traditional martial arts training, or at least Aikido training, didn't really like come directly. It wasn't like, oh, I can right away apply these moves. It took a long time for me to learn the fundamentals of fighting and then be like, hey, I can move, I can use this Aikido move here. I can do this Aikido mm -hmm. thing here. Initially, it didn't come up. And I guess part of me hoped it would and it didn't. But but I realized quickly because I was documenting the journey, I was sharing it. Other people were sharing their stories and I realized, okay, this is universal. It's just the way it is. I have to accept it. Uh, there were good parts too, though. Like my body awareness was on a greater level than a regular student. I was so used to looking and observing these complex Aikido movements and replicating them that when I was shown a jujitsu technique or a mixed martial arts technique, I would look at it and be like, okay, I can remember like five different things that I was told. And I would oh, be always... Okay. I was always hungry for more like a new student would be like, Oh, I'm just going to try and do this. And they would probably hear like one out of 10 things. And I was like, I would hear as much as I can. And then I would be like, Hey, what about this tiny detail? What about this detail? And I was like, always hungry. And I think that came from <clears throat> me being me already having that mindset of learning martial arts, which is great. Um, but then other than that, uh, yeah, also that, I guess that, tra that transition from, one environment to a different environment just me not being comfortable <laughs> mm. but that's but that's just because traditional martial arts or specifically if i take my example like keto is so sterile in a way like in a, in, a, in a nice way you know it's just like the dojo is clean and everyone is calm and and there's meditation and everyone is respectful everyone is bowing and there's respect in combat sports as well uh but it's like tradition doesn't really matter and then it's 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 a different environment mm -hmm. so so it took me a while to get used to that but i think that can apply to any regular person as well like that's not necessarily specifically to traditional martial arts sure and, and you know I, i'm sure there are folks out there who train aikido mm. and there are folks out there who um probably see aikido in a negative light you know it's probably it's uh, of the traditional arts it's probably the most polarizing right it's mm. the one that that gets the most gets people to, to, to talk the loudest, right? Either yeah. for or against. Yeah. So here, here's the question, if if I may. Sure. Do you regret your time in Aikido? It's it's a big question. And it's mm -hmm. one that popped up a number of times through through my journey. Uh and I I'd say I don't regret it. Like I never had like a pure regret of, oh, I hate my life for doing this. I wish I never done this. Like there's, there was certainly the possibility, but I didn't feel like I went that route. Mm -hmm. uh, I still found a, a lot of good things, like especially now as as I'm balancing and recalibrating myself and being able to look at the and distinguish good things from bad things and take the good things and leave the bad things away. So I'm like, oh, I learned actually a lot of great things. Like it was very uh, influential in the way I developed and became who I am right now. Uh, also, it's... A bit easier for me not to regret it because essentially that became my main story which i mm -hmm. shared publicly like that became my superpower in a way i'm like the guy who was aikido and then he mm -hmm. quit aikido and he became mma and that puts me in a unique position where i can actually look at both sides and and talk about it like say mm -hmm. oh when i was doing aikido and now i'm doing this i can compare it so in a way that that's a very uh, great position to be in as well uh, so I don't necessarily regret it, but part of me is just sad because I think I'm just sad about the whole process and realizing that there are other people who are still going through that process where the relationship is not always the healthiest between the sensei and the student or the senpai and, and the kohai. Uh, and uh, that's the questioning is not encouraged in mm. some of the schools, not all schools. They're obviously good schools, but many schools, it's just like, it's, I think that's Westerners being more Japanese than Japanese. Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I, I do. I do actually. <laughs> so there was actually a Japanese lady who was, uh, I was training Aikido with, and she told me that she was shocked 
the first time she moved from Japan and walked into Aikido Dojo and saw Westerners acting more Japanese than Japanese. But I think that's that's the downside where we worship the whole structure so mm-hmm. much that we start to lean so heavily into that we lose track of why we're doing this. Uh, so some of it's sad that that happens and that uh, I was susceptible to that. But at the same time, as I said, like that became my superpower in a way. So I can't right. have too many regrets about it. Okay. That was all pretty much one question. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. That, that, I said, what was the beginning of your training? And we got there. Awesome. I love it. You make my, make my job easy. Appreciate it. <laughs> so you get into MMA and I think I heard you say at 28. I think I was around 28. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think 28 when I started practicing while still running the dojo or 27 okay. 28 and i think around 20 i'm i'm bad with time but probably around okay. 29 when i completely moved to to mma yeah okay and if we follow that timeline what's the next significant point we should talk about it's a good question uh so there's 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 like a few moments i mean i can just i guess i can recap what happened yeah, yeah. next i think that that's a fun journey and then and then move to the major things which I guess are happening right now. Right. So I quit my dojo. I, I quit the organization. I closed my dojo. My students were very sad. I didn't see it coming. I was very naive, I guess, because I was like, oh, I don't love IQ anymore. I'm sure my students don't as well. But turns out they still loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was like, uh, yeah, it was uh, too bad that, you know, it happened to them because of what happened to me. Uh, the losing of Aikido. Mm. But uh, then I moved to the States, trained for six months in that intensive MMA program, uh, had my first MMA cage fight, which was uh, quite an experience. You know, it's crazy to realize that somebody, including myself, that somebody is willingly puts themselves in a little cage, has themselves locked in with just two more dudes, you know, the, the referee or whatever that right term is and then the other fighter whose only sole purpose is to beat you up in a way where you submit and give up it's like wow and and we're doing this intentionally and we're not even getting paid (laughs) so yeah it's crazy but i did it uh it was a all in all was good experience then i went to train with uh a pro mma team in uh, in Dublin as as BG Ireland, that's like the team of Conor McGregor. Okay. Uh, but the the thing is that I was like the complete underdog. Uh, I was not really supposed to be there, but I kind of talked my way into it. I thought, yeah, okay, yeah that that I, I got to say that sounds interesting. That after one fight, and, and how did that fight <laughs> did you win? I I did lose by the decision. Okay, all right. Yeah. So your so your first fight, yeah, you lose. So it's. Uh, you know, it's we even can't worse. even say that you're <laughs> you're a fighting phenom, and they said, "Oh, right. we got to get this guy in." Yeah, how yeah, yeah, no. how did you get how did you get onto a team, let alone a team of such prominence? Through ways of charm. I guess. <laughs> I, I, I want to take lessons. This is yeah. massive. No, actually, there was a very specific moment, and it's I, I do like that that moment uh, in what happened. So I was filming some stuff for. The gym where I was training MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And uh, part of that organization is Coach John Kavanaugh, the, the founder of that gym, which is uh, Conor McGregor is part of. And uh, he was teaching a seminar, and I had to film a conversation between him and another instructor. And in the meantime, I was like, hey, John, do you have a minute to like talk to me on my camera, on my like channel? And he was kind enough to say yes. And after that, after a short conversation, we just kept talking between each other he mentioned that he's reviving his youtube channel and i said well you know i know this and that about youtube and and i was like the funny part is that internally i was in the uh consideration of should i tell him that i could maybe help out and like do something with him or should i just shut up and say nothing and the tempting part is to say nothing because especially Mm -hmm. for being self-aware self-conscious it's like ah if you we all don't want to be rejected. I'm just going to look stupid if I say this. So that debate was happening in me. And I was like, as he was walking out the door, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to suggest it. And I was like, you know, by the way, I might drop by Dublin, do some filming if you're interested. And turns out he was interested. Uh, after a couple of emails, he saw that I can offer some something. And then I came to film him and make like content for his channel. 
And as a way to express uh, his gratitude, he said, well, you might as well join uh, the pro MMA team because he knew I was, at that moment, I was actually considering to try to commit and become a professional fighter. So it mm. kind of made sense. The only thing that didn't make sense is, was that I was like the the most underdog underdog ever in that yeah. group. Uh, they were all nice to me, like nobody beat my ass up, but I was all constantly exhausted, tired, only at, and then I did that for like three months. But then at the end, I when I started training with new guys, I was like, oh, I actually progressed a lot. But I didn't feel like that mm -hmm. because all the other guys were also progressing and they were so way ahead of me. So eventually I burned out from doing that experience, uh, from training with pro guys for three months uh, day to day. Mm -hmm. And also I did like a six month program before and it was just too much for my body. I, I went too deep, too quick. And then I did like a bit of a break, uh, like a, for about a year, I was kind of training martial arts a little bit, but also just exploring what else I could do in my life. Then I recovered, started doing martial arts again, had another second MMA fight, uh, which was a bit unfortunate because I injured and had a pinched nerve mm. and then fought despite injury. So I don't know if that's smart, but I did it. But I had a second MMA fight. Uh, eventually, I became... Uh, interested to do boxing and in the meantime I was also experimenting with Aikido I was like okay how does that what now I have a better base of how to of being able to fight how does Aikido work now and for some time that was a hobby like kind of just a thing I would do I was not like I'm gonna be the guy who reinvents Aikido it's like mm -hmm. a lot of people want me to be that I don't think that's the great way to go at least for me uh, but I would experiment with that and then the latest fascinating thing that happened is this thing called the Ultimate Self-Defense Championship that we recently pulled off and did. So that's one thing. And then the other, an experience through the Ultimate Self-Defense Championship or USDC, as we call it, uh, I rediscovered the desire to actually dive deeper into seeing if I can make Aikido functional, not to reinvent the wheel, but, but that's sure. like, these are two big things which are happening right now. Okay, and I, I want to jump into those, but, but first sure. I, want to, I want to go back just on the video yeah. part. Yeah. When, when did you start getting into video so deeply that you're traveling to different countries to film? Was that as a result of just being at this MMA gym, or was that something that happened outside of training? I think that's the mix of skill and charm, <laughs> again. Okay. But I mean, by charm, I'm just joking. I mean, you know, I, I think by charm, I mean just sometimes just putting myself into positions where I offer my services. Mm -hmm. uh, so to elaborate on that, uh, my filming journey started when I was running my Aikido Dojo still. And my girlfriend suggested for me to film a YouTube video for my students. And I thought, yeah, why not? I did it. And I realized, oh, actually, I like it because I always like to dabble in editing and in, in, in filming. Like I, I was never very good at it at that time, but, but I enjoyed doing that. And I realized, oh, actually, I can mix that passion or that hobby with filming my stuff, which I teach anyway, very convenient for my students, they have curriculum. But then being as ambitious as I am, very quickly, I decided, you know what, I can actually do this better, I can like, I can actually do this well. Mm -hmm. And so I started pushing the envelope looking for how can I not only improve the quality, but improve the content. And the Aikido content at that moment was very underserviced, I would say, because of the traditions it was all just elderly Japanese super masters saying nothing, just showing techniques. And that was it. You know, that's that's the Aikido videos you have. And I was like, well, there's so much that's happening that people need. Like I was very, I was always an instructor who was like, hey, let me explain this to you. If you're struggling, I'm going to go with you. So I I put that on onto my videos. I was like, you know, what? I'm good. I'm going to be that young guy who's going to give out everything he knows and and not hesitate about it so people loved it uh the channel became successful i kept pushing the envelope then i filmed the aikido versus mma video where i sparred with the mma fighter and got my ass kicked and that that blew up the channel that blew up my my mm -hmm. say, people love those game. videos yeah and and also too i i think i i did it very just spontaneously the way i did it but uh, i realized now being experiencing both sides of the world i'm like oh yeah i guess I, because I took it very uh, positively. I was like, mm -hmm. I put myself up to show, okay, look, Aikido doesn't work and that's fine. And people appreciated that. They were like, oh, look, this guy is like 
okay with getting his ass kicked. That's kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> so eventually I started expanding my, my subjects, interviewing various experts, obviously developing my skills with filming. And then when I moved to the States, uh, to, I documented my MMA training, uh, preparations for my first fight. But also I saw that the gym was struggling with their content production. Like they had a guy, but the guy wasn't doing a great job. And uh, my charm came in. <laughs> I don't think that's the right word. But I one day I was talking to the owner and I was like, hey, you know what? Actually, I could film some stuff for you if you're interested. And he was interested and I did a good enough job. And uh, then that relationship developed. Then through that, I was filming Coach John Kavanaugh. And then I offered him that I can film him. And then that then I was traveling with John and filming various events for him, like different uh, you know, uh, countries, different locations, which was cool. Uh, but also then once people would understand that I can, I'm capable at filming and I'm capable of producing stuff, I would get other offers. Like mm -hmm. somebody would be like, hey, can you film this for me and that for me? And for some time I did that. Was it all uh, martial arts stuff? Essentially, yeah. Okay. I did a couple of side projects, but actually I realized it's, I'm not as passionate about it, so mm. I, I, I wasn't leaning into it. But uh, eventually, I would also travel for my stuff because I kept elevating my, my level of production and content. So I would travel to meet these great people, whatever they are. Like That's the thing I did. I'm like, oh, you live here? Screw that. I'm going to get the tickets, fly to you, and film that video. Uh, but then that's time. Uh, that takes time. That takes energy. Mm. And and once my channel grew big enough where I realized, you know what, every moment I spend outside of filming stuff for myself, uh, when I'm filming stuff for others, I'm sacrificing my own projects. Mm -hmm. That's becoming detrimental to, to my progress. So now I'm super cautious about filming anything for anyone besides myself. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's kind of the quick summary of the whole okay. filming journey. Yeah. All right. So... USDC Ultimate Self Defense Championship. But, yes. yes. Where, where does that come from? Where does that <laughs> idea start? Yeah. So uh, a few years ago, uh, that's actually kind of a tie into my desire to keep pushing the mm. envelope and keep pushing the the content. And uh, there are moments actually I have this interesting quality that I noticed over the years, like a pattern where I improve upon, say, content creation. And I become better than I was. And I become satisfied for a moment. I'm like, oh, I'm doing so great. And then I would become, I become dissatisfied at some point. Either it becomes like the norm and then sometimes it fluctuates. And I hate the, the fluctuation when things are worse than they are. They're much better than they were. But now I'm used to the new norm. And I'm like, oh, look, this sucks. I didn't get like 50,000 views. I got only 40,000 views mm -hmm. where, you know, two years ago, I, was, I would be like, this is so great. So I become super frustrated. I would become obsessed for like a few weeks or a month that I need to level up. I need to go to the next level. I need to learn new things. I would go to courses and question what I could do better. And then I would usually come up with like the next level of content. So that would repeat itself like once a year or so. And I was in one of those moments where I was like, ah, I'm not doing good enough. I could do better. And I sat down with a notebook and I asked myself, what's the most badass, kick-ass, content that I could create, even if it's not like realistic, like even if I couldn't pull it off, but what would that be? What mm. would my audience go crazy for? And I came up with the concept. Well, first of all, everybody loves collabs, like YouTubers mm -hmm. meeting other YouTubers filming or, or, or some celebrities. And uh, I thought, okay, we need to get together. I need to get everyone together, like the, the, the good, the well-known names in the martial arts uh, YouTube space. But then I was like, if we fight each other, that's kind of silly in my the way I see it, because we are of different age, of different weight and different experiences. It's like you could easily, more or less easily guess the winner. And it's just like, I'm not excited about that. But I was like, but what if we make it self-defense, which is, you know, it's it weight matters, of course, age matters. Mm -hmm. But then there's so much that goes into it that the winner will not be clear cut. You will not know who wins until the very end. And I thought, okay, this is great. I like the concept. So I take the best YouTubers or like well-known martial arts YouTubers and put them through a self-defense championship and see who does best. Also promote uh, critical thinking and martial arts, which was always my thing. And uh, I come up with this concept and I have no clue how to pull it off. I'm like, okay, well, this is great. It's on paper. 
But then one day I meet a guy in Sydney, Australia, uh, Jeff Phillips, who runs a facility and does this type of championship for his students once per year. Mm. And I'm like, hey, you know what? What if I would bring a bunch of YouTubers? Could you like put us through the championship and then we do this thing? And he was excited. Uh, and he said, yes. Then COVID started. Mm. Uh, then to make things even more fun, uh, Jeff Phillips, the co-host, he got cancer. <laughs> so <laughs> we're like, whoa, Brutal. this is, yeah, this is not looking great for us. But Jeff uh, went into remission. That's the term. Yeah. So he got better. Then uh, COVID started calming down. And uh, initially, I was still not sure if we can pull this off. But Jeff was like, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And I was like, you know what? Let's do it. And uh, long story short, uh, we did it. <laughs> and how did it go? It went uh, really well. Uh, we had only one injury. <laughs> out, out of how we, many people? Uh, we were six participants, but also a bunch of attackers. And okay. anyway, that's, so. I think that's a... We yeah, that a win. That's yeah, a win. <laughs> that's the first thing that came to my mind, like a measure of success. But obviously, there's other measures of, of success too. So, um, first of all, the experience itself was really good uh, because the group I think was very good. The content creators uh, were we bonded together well. We played. We 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 had a good chemistry, and I think everybody when they turned into videos, everybody enjoyed it. That this wasn't essentially it's like reality TV. This was like a reality show, mm. and that's how I designed it and pro produced it. Where it's like you see people talking to the camera. It's like oh, this is what I was planning to do, and then you see what happened, and then they reflect about it like reality TV essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, in reality TV, often people are very negative, or they push for. Like, oh, we need conflict, we need drama, we need to put like a, a person who's really crappy so that everyone would become, you know, upset and etc. And we didn't have the drama, but we had a lot of camaraderie and people loved it. And it was a great to go through that experience as well. Like to have five days of brutal uh, self-defense challenges where you get punched and stabbed and every all the stuff, all the bunch of stuff happens to you and then you do it together with other guys. It's, it's a bonding experience. Uh, so that was very cool. And the series itself, I think it turned out very nice. Uh, people who watched it loved it. Uh, they said that they learned a lot from it. It was also a mix between education and entertainment. Mm. So I think it was a successful project and successful enough for us to do season two, which is now the, the big thing, which is where yeah, you're working on that right now. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah, making my life. Yeah. What's going to be different between season one and season two. So. First of all, we expanded the roster or like the lineup of participants. Uh, so for season one, it was uh, essentially content creators, uh, which okay. still like I see Mike, one of the participants, former police officer, uh, SWAT member, et cetera. Then we had a professional fighter, a retired professional fighter, uh, me, former Aikido Black Belt. So it was, a, it was still like a mixed group, which mm -hmm. was interesting. But now for season two, we have uh, like a professional UFC fighter who's an active fighter, like an up and coming mm -hmm. fighter. Uh, then we have a you can you can name these names. I I, I know yeah. what you're talking about. You okay, okay. I just want to be yeah, uh, okay. nice to the audience who's listening. But yeah, I can I'll name the names. So so there's Nathan Levy. He's he's an up and coming fighter, like the only Israeli fighter in uh, UFC who's also a karate black belt, uh, mm -hmm. so, which makes it even more cooler. Uh, then uh, I'm not participating this time because I'm going to fully devote myself to directing and producing. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we have uh, Jeff Chan, uh, the professional fighter who's also content creator, coming back mm -hmm. again. Uh, we have Ranton, who is a content creator, but he has a different background. He is a Shaolin disciple. Mm -hmm. So he lived in the Shaolin monastery for, I think, a year or so, and he trained Kung Fu, maybe longer. He trained Kung Fu. And he doesn't, he barely does any combat sports. So, so it's yeah. going to be interesting to see how he does in all those situations. Yeah. And he's just a very fun guy. So, so he's going to be part of that. Uh, who else do we have? We have a You're basketball missing one of my player. favorite. If, yeah. If, if, if who when I that? looked at one of my favorite Tell people me. who's been on the show, Jesse. Yes, Jesse. Damn. He's like the, the, the big, one of the biggest stars. And I just, yeah. <laughs> and I just uh, didn't mention him right now. So yes, Jesse, I was actually, Jesse was supposed to be on season one, but he couldn't make it. Okay. Due to scheduling and for, issues. for folks that might be in the audience, yeah. Jesse who, cause you know, yeah, sure. Um, Jesse Einkamp. Yeah. Jesse Einkamp, karate nerd, yeah. uh, karate guy. black belt, uh, great guy. 
uh, we're we're good friends. We meet each other regularly, so so it's easier to get on board mm. people who you know already. Uh, but he was supposed to be there for season one, but uh, he couldn't make it. Now he's there for season two, so really exciting. He's he he has some combat sports experience, but his primary focus is karate, mm. and he's a, actually a pretty big and and strong dude. He's a strong so guy, yeah. He's a very strong guy, yeah. So it's gonna be interesting how he does. We also have a basketball player. Uh, who he has a TikTok following, but the most important point is uh, that he's a tall, athletic person. Mm. And the reason we really wanted to get him on board is because season one proved to us that size and weight matters even more than we thought. And uh, the hypothetical question came up, okay, so what if you get a just a physically fit big guy? How much does that uh, help you in self-defense? How much does that mm-hmm. take care of? And he's training right now. He's going to train for, he's going to have six months of self-defense training. Like he's training with a co-host, with his students. They have like a full, uh, full-time full self-defense school. So he's he's learning the skills. But that, again, that makes it even more fascinating to me because we ha- now have an athletic uh, tall guy who has six months of training. Which like, I assume everybody's going to have many, many years. He's the outlier with six exactly. months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to just throw them in with going, what are hands and how do they work? Yeah, right, right, right. So so all of that is going to come to, to that point and see, okay, so how does he do against compared to like a UFC fighter? How does he do mm-hmm. against, you know, a, a karateka or a martial arts guy who who's much smaller and didn't do martial arts uh, combat sports, but did traditional martial arts? So so yeah, I think it's a quite a fascinating lineup. And uh I'm wondering if I forgot anything else. I need to look at the picture. <laughs> or maybe, That's, well, where yeah. if you know, I, I bet at this point people are, are sure. Yeah, I want to. I want to know more. So you know, yeah. let's make sure we get that out there. Where sure. can people go to check out season yeah. one and how do they learn more about season two? Yes. Yeah, so season one is on Martial Arts Journey channel. That's the name of my channel, mm-hmm. and all the content is there. And uh, because some of the episodes are named differently. Uh, and they're like episode one, episode two, episode three, but they're not necessarily named like that. There's a playlist where you p- click on the playlist on the main channel and then you get all the episodes one by one. And yeah, if people like it, usually they watch them. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully people will go and enjoy it. Well, it's clear you put a lot of time into it. And, you know, th- this episode's going to stay up indefinitely. But if I remember correctly right now, you are fundraising for season two. True, so, true. Uh, I'm very happy that we managed to reach the financial goal of it. Uh, okay. It was it was kind of a thank you. It was kind of a crazy and 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 stressful and and funny situation in a way where I knew that I spent all my savings for season one, and I got a little bit of from crowdfunding, but that was by far not as much as I needed. And then I realized how much money I need for season two, and I don't have the budget yet, or I didn't have personally. And we need to film season two quickly because uh, at the end of the year, they are going to demolish the facility where it's happening. Why? I think it's a government building. It's not okay. like owned by the, by the, by Jeff Phillips and, okay. and they want to like restructure it or something. Right, like they're going to put something else up. Okay. It's not yeah. like a condemned building, you know, the uh, roof well, isn't falling in. No, it used to be like a TV studio or something, like a government okay. TV studio, and they abandoned it like completely. Uh, where, okay. where, where you walk when you walk around, you see like cups of tea, which were standing there for like six years. Which was, <laughs> which is one of the reasons we did the zombie apocalypse thing because it's like the perfect conditions to do yeah. a zombie apocalypse. So, so it's the, the building's falling in a little bit. A little bit. Like the, <laughs> okay. well, the good part is that we can do every, anything we want. Like nobody cares. It's going to get demolished. So we can yeah. like, kick a wall, <laughs> destroy a window, whatever, you know, and oh, it's, cool. it's, it's going to be fine. So we can go all out, especially right now, just before uh, season two is going to be just before it gets demolished, but we need to film it quick. So we need to get the finances. And I decided to, there was like play safe or, or like go, go hard and go all in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew the amount of money I need, like the bare minimum which is still a hefty uh, amount of money. And uh, I thought in crowdfunding, you can choose like flexible goal or set goal. And flexible goal is uh, where whatever money you get, you take. It doesn't matter if you reach your goal or not. And the set goal is if you don't reach your goal, you don't get the money. Everybody Mm -hmm. gets their money back. And it was, I was 
it was it's very stressful to organize this whole yeah. thing and i was stressed because it was stressful to organize season one as well because i was always thinking about money and how will i make sure that it, i get enough for plane tickets and lodging and food and everything it was a constant stress uh source of stress and now i, I realize if i'm going to put flexible goal and if i'm not going to collect the money i need the bare minimum it's going to i'm going to live in a constant state of hell where i'm going to always think like oh no i still need so much more money and but then i would i would still be in a safe place where i would i would know i would still get something mm -hmm. but then i thought you know what i'll do the other way i'll go the other way i'll just say we either do this or we don't do this we either collect this amount of money yeah we either collect this money or not and if, it's, if not it's not going to happen and it was risky it was scary to do it because mm -hmm. i'm like what sure. if we get like 90 percent and we don't reach the 100 percent, and i don't get nothing and nothing happens uh, but I decided, you know what, have faith, trust it, because a lot of people were asking for season two. And I thought, okay, well, you're asking it. Let's let's make it work together then. Mm -hmm. And in seven days, we reached the goal. And I was like, oh, my God, this was like crazy. And it's still like slowly going up. But obviously, people now know this is going to happen. Really so there's right? no, yeah. It sounds like a testament to how much people enjoyed season one. I think I think so. It was it was like a really cool moment for me. Just like that day when it hit the number, I was just sitting here in front of my computer i was like oh man i guess it was worth it <laughs> it's like it, i guess you said i felt like okay this is a sign that everything is going well so it was cool so uh, what what's next are you already thinking of what season three might be so there's two in a way yes uh okay. but essentially there's two things on my plate right now so so one is uh we are not closed from the idea of multiple seasons mm -hmm. uh but we're also our decision is to go step by step like mm -hmm. see how it goes and then make a decision uh so if season two goes well which i think it's possible i think a lot of people are still just discovering usdc right. and and they're like oh my god how did i just find it now i love this so meaning a lot of people just have no idea about it and because on, in youtube there's this curse where you release a video a certain amount of people watch it and you have this internal feeling and impression that, okay, that's all the people that are interested in this. Nobody else cares. Nobody else will ever watch this video. But then reality is nobody will ever see everything. And so you may sometimes create something which a lot of people will love, would love, but they just never get to, to touch it. So that's actually one of the reasons we want to do season two so that season two and the new competitors would attract a new audience uh, they're following and they naturally would get acquainted with both season one and season two and the concept so uh but still uh there's a, a feeling like okay we're not sure if this is going to work out or not so let's do our best and once season two comes out if it's successful uh then probably we'll go for season three and we'll switch locations probably not in australia anymore because it's, it's hard to make an event in australia when no one else is from australia right. well i mean the why the did you pick australia are, because of the host the co-host jeff okay. phillips uh he has the facility okay he has the expertise he's there already and the trained attackers are there mm. and he has also uh, a portion of the equipment but mainly it's the facility is just so good for that uh like we have the whole warehouse uh like it's not really a warehouse but like the whole facility huge building lots of like office areas and a, a cinema area and the basketball court it's like it's like perfect and uh, and that's why we really want to do this before it gets demolished and then then we're gonna have to think about it but to make sure i answer the question fully so that's one part of the plate so make cool. season two and then think about if it's successful continue to make season three four etc uh with new contenders and improved uh constantly improved content but then the other thing is uh, what i'm excited about as well i mentioned that i used to more or less play with my aikido in combat sports and just do it as a hobby like okay let's see what happens but then uh, uh i have not actually spoken about this before this is the first time i'm going on record but i think i think this is the perfect moment i think the plan is that the first video is going to go on saturday uh, so I think it's it's great timing. So anyway, so uh, after USDC, I really pushed for like production quality and mm -hmm. storytelling and everything. And 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 people uh, spoke about it. It seems like it, it worked out. Like the production quality was was the next level. And I was like, shoot, okay. There's a lot of new people who came into my channel, and they're used to this level of 
production quality and storytelling. It's like, I can't just do some random videos right now. I need to come up with something great. And I realized that the next content that I want to make in between seasons of USDC is to kind of make like a spin-off. Uh, you know, the whole Marvel universe and mm. superheroes is very popular these days. And I guess there's there's a bit of a concept from there where it's like you have the Avengers and then you have, you know, like Captain America, one, two, three. Like, so what's happening for Captain America between these things? And because the channel, my channel is essentially about me and my journey, I decided that it's time for me to, instead of just making it as a hobby, to devote myself more because a lot of people are interested. Okay, so how would functional like Aikido look like? What mm. does it take to make it functional? So I decided that I will focus more on that journey without having a concrete result. Like, again, I want to put on record that it's not my goal to make like a new style of Aikido, but uh, but it's the journey that matters for me. And uh, my plan is to make it into like a reality show as well, like a serious mm. uh so my first episode is going to be a recap of what happened until now, like the origin story, <laughs> so to say, so to speak. So my Aikido versus May video, how I got my ass kicked, how it, made, how it made me question it. So the first few episodes, like for anyone who, because that video is already old, it's like six years old. It, it's, it was made by my standards of that time. And I look at it now, I'm like, ah, oh, this video could be so much better. So it's my redemption <laughs> <laughs> uh, video to make it much to make it the way I can right now to be, to tell a good story to explain what really happened there yeah. and to get new audience in and then after a few episodes after like everyone's included into what's happening continue the journey from now going to experts uh, seeing what they can offer to make Aikido better what works what doesn't work how to improve it and and just document it episode by episode as as that journey goes how it continues as a continual journey and to see where it goes instead of uh, beforehand. It was for me, it was just like, oh, I make like one video about Kung Fu and one video about boxing. And then I make a video trying out Aikido. But now my idea is to like really commit to, to this journey. Yeah. Mm. It, you're, you're not the only one working on this. And I think it's a fascinating subject. We've had a couple of people on the show mm. who, and it's, it's not just Aikido. Honestly, we've had a number of people on the show for whom they take what they're given and they they question it just as you didn't say, wait a second, maybe there's more, maybe there's a better way. Maybe my instructors and their instructors and their instructors actually didn't know what they were doing. And, and we've got to find a way to get back, way back. Maybe there's something there. And I think the more people working on things like this, like you, I think the better we all are. Yeah. We all train for different reasons, of course. And yeah. Yeah, being I, able to to take those whys in different directions, I think, is really great. Yeah, yeah, I think. Well, initially, I was surprised by how universal this journey is because, mm. and and also to other people, where especially even people who had the exact same experience like I did, uh, they thought their martial art is one thing, they tested it, it didn't work, and and they were excommunicated essentially. Like mm. it's a very common story, uh, but then. That was I, I got to hear those stories like around six years ago. So so I as far as I can tell, I was the first one to document it so publicly mm. and openly that journey. And a lot of people who saw it were like, oh dude, you're saying the exact thing, things, the same things that I went through, or or you're going through the same things I went through. And I thought I'm alone. And I have like hundreds of emails from people who who all thought they're alone. And now I think it's we're in a better spot because as you said, like there are there are a number of people who do that publicly uh, question pressure test martial arts uh, bringing critical thinking so i think people who start to question their martial arts uh, find support and realization that they're not alone much quicker which mm. is great uh, but still uh to some degree i am sometimes surprised like even maybe ufc is not the best answer but still was like a groundbreaking uh, event for martial arts yeah. where suddenly we get this ninjutsu guy and sumo guy and all we're different types of martial arts coming in and and eventually finding a formula of what works best for fighting under those conditions mm -hmm. which you know becomes like super powerful essentially for as a fighting form uh and uh, and so it becomes quite evident of it seems like it becomes quite evident of what does not work but then there's still a lot of people who, like the infamous mcdojos where it's like they do the craziest things which if you have any grasp of fighting you you look at it and you're like 
this is this this is not gonna work. You know, people aren't like Aikido, you know, people are not gonna fall for you so easily. And you have the the dark side of that is that you have uh I like to get, make a distinction between explanation and justification. Mm. It's like the explanation would be so why is everyone falling so easily? The explanation would be, well, because part of that, part of that is yes, because if you're not gonna fall, it's gonna hurt. But it's not only about that. But then the explanation. Part of that explanation would be, well, we're falling because that's the way we were taught. And that's mm-hmm. the way, you know, our sensei and sensei was taught. And we're just keeping up with the tradition. It's like, that would be one of the explanations. But you get, but usually get justifications, which are like, well, as I said, like, it's part true, but part not true. It's like, if you will not fall like this, if you will not submit to me, if you will resist your arm and wrist will break. And it's like, I tried it. It doesn't break. Like, <laughs> like it's like, I mean, it can I'm not saying it can't, you have to be, but you have to be like a, a bad person to destroy that elbow. But usually if people really resist, they will spin out of it. It's like, there's, it's not abs- as absolute as it's told in Aikido. And there's a lot of other uh, moments where it's like justification, justifications. It's like, oh, it's like, this is too deadly. So you can't use it in MMA. You know, it's like, this is, this is, this is so dangerous that, we only practice it with cooperative partners and you can, ha- you, there's no way to practice it with a resisting partner. It's like, maybe there's some truth to that, but it's probably not all true. So, but my point is after, since fighting became so popular and it's so mainstream right now, uh, it, it would seem like people would be more aware of uh, look at, they would look at something and be like, okay, well, this clearly doesn't work. Let's go somewhere else. But still you get a lot of schools and a lot of instructors and still a lot of videos where somebody does something super crazy and they have a falling, they have a full dojo, I'm expecting and hoping and trusting that it's harder to get people through the door now and probably like a specific type of people go there or they don't stay as long. Mm. But it still it still exists. And so my point is as well with me and the other guys questioning it, uh, martial arts, trying to make them functional publicly. Uh, I am certain the world of martial arts is evolving. People are more clear. Okay, this 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 is just tradition. This is this is more for our own personal experience. This is for fighting. This is for etiquette, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and the work will never be done because yeah, exactly. It, it's a constantly moving target. Society is constantly shifting. Who knows what the next technology will be? You know, what will virtual reality do for martial arts training? What will full immersion with tactile response due for mm. martial arts training, you know, at some point we'll be there. True. So really cool. I'm glad you're doing this work. If people want to Thank find you. you, you know, what are all the websites and the social media? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the best way and where most of my effort goes into is the Marsh, uh, the YouTube channel called martial arts journey. Uh, there's like a website, martial arts journey.com. And then if somebody goes there, they'll find like information and the breakdown of, the ultimate self-defense championship mm-hmm. but youtube is essentially the place for, to, to find me okay awesome hmm. now it's your your shot to to leave them hanging i guess uh, what are your <laughs> final words to the audience um i think there there's a few different ways i could approach this but because we spoke about that whole functionality and mm-hmm. questioning it's it's such a big theme for me i I think I I just want to clarify a couple of things uh, in that is that I went through the path of being very extreme. It's like either this martial art is the best or it sucks, which a lot of people tend to do with martial arts, but it's like either it works or it doesn't work or either this is great for self-defense or not. And uh, I think the best path is still like the middle path Hmm. uh, to, to make sure that we question and we ask ourselves, we never take something just like somebody said, this is the best. We don't believe it just because somebody said it's the best, but we we carefully look at it. We respect educated opinion. Uh, we respect ex- experts, but we always also go through our checking process. And uh, as long as people go through that, I think a lot of martial arts have a lot of great things to offer. Like we don't need to eradicate Aikido. Aikido has a place in the world. Uh, people can enjoy it for what it is. But the point the most important point, I think, is is to to be aware of what it is and what it's not. And what was unfortunate for me was that by both my instructors, I was promised 
that I, that I will become a capable fighter and self-defense expert by learning only this. And I think that was not true, but but other people have that same uh, belief given to them. Uh, but as long as we're clear of what is what, uh, and uh, we make sure that we go to the right place for what our needs are, I think, yeah, a lot, a lot of martial arts can offer a lot of cool things. Thanks for sticking around. Did you enjoy today's episode? I certainly did. You know, one of my favorite things is that people take martial arts, they see what's going on, and they say, I can make it better. And then they try to make it better. I love when people try to make things better. And the more important something is to me, the more I want to see people trying to make it better. Not everyone's going to succeed in making it better. That's okay. But they're making an effort. And I love being able to support folks who say, you know what, we can improve this. Because as I see it, there are two ways that we can support martial arts in general. We can pass it on or we can improve it. There's nothing wrong with either one. Both are necessary. Everyone can improve it in parallel. It doesn't work that way. But when we have someone who is spending a lot of time and energy improving, they're going to get my support. So, Focus, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you. Listeners, audience, viewers, whatever you want me to call you, make sure you check out today's sponsor, Safest Family on the Block. If you haven't yet, do it. If you're not following them on social media, do it. You need to. I'm asking you to. It's important. And of course, check out the book that Jason put together with the code WHISTLEKICK23 to save 25% off. It's a great, great book. The show's great. Jason's great. If you like this show, you'll like what he's doing. I, I would, you know what? I'll bet you. If you check out what he's doing, if you don't dig it, you let me know and I'll, I don't know, give you money. Something. I feel that confident. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can follow us, Whistlekick, on social media with the handles at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. If you have feedback, guest suggestions, anything like that, let us know. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.